We've looked at the IT12 once, but we're going to look at the IT12 again because this time it's got a different CPU and a different set of specs and it performs differently. So it's really a different computer with the same name because in 2025 we can do things like that. This is the Geekcom IT12 and this version has the Core i7-12800, 12800, 1280p. And it also has 32 gigabytes of RAM, but you can get it covered in that. I am in a hurry. I have to be somewhere and I don't feel so hot. So if this video is a little wild, keep watching. It'll be even wilder. I don't know. So up to 64 gigabytes of memory, up to five terabytes of storage. You can get it configured in several different ways. This version has one terabyte M.2 and a 32 gigabyte RAM. <laughs> Yeah, it's a 32 gigabyte RAM. You tell I'm a little out of it. We're going to keep going. We can do this. I use OEM keys for a few different reasons. This is the price you're going to pay for Windows 11 Pro. If you get a retail key, let's check those prices on whokeys.com. $30. You know, we can do better. Put in TS25. Click apply. There we go. $23.22. You got Windows 11 Pro and Home. Same with Windows 10 Pro and Home. We now have LTSC versions. This version of Windows 10 will give you security updates until 2032. And it doesn't come with any bloat or AI nonsense. No copilot. No recall. The same for Windows 11. The LTSC. SC editions are volume licenses usually acquired in the same way you would get an OEM key and we have two flavors of office if you're sick of paying that monthly subscription well you can get yourself an offline version of office 2019 or office 2016 let's go ahead and check out with our copy of windows 11 pro all right just put in my card info there we go click on view keys and codes once you get to the user center click on get the key you'll see your key right here in the middle go ahead and highlight that copy that press start and then type activate you'll see activation settings go ahead and click on that and then right here it says not active just click on change product key paste in our product key and then click on activate hey look at that active head over to whokeys.com thanks to them for sponsoring and now on to our regularly scheduled program plenty of ports on this plenty of build quality it's got all of the build quality and some extra because uh, when it comes to build, build quality geekcom is pretty much top of the line they do a ridiculous number of tests and this little chassis this little metal chassis it's got an internal metal chassis uh, that kind of gives it some rigidity it can support 200 kilograms so like almost an american could stand on this without any problems but you can put stuff on it or whatever they drag it behind cars they do all kinds of ridiculous tests with these to make sure that they are um, durable enough for pretty much any environment so one of the main things about this is you can do a lot with it because it's an i7 and has a lot of cores um, and efficiency cores as well but it's only 28 watts Lower power design means you can use it for many different things without having to worry about the power bill, but also it keeps the temperatures lower. So during sustained workloads, the entire system's only pulling 28 to 35 watts. As far as wireless connectivity, we've got Wi-Fi 6E, we got Bluetooth 5.2, and there's 2.5 gigabit Ethernet on the back. I'll get to that in just a second. Then we have M.2 with PCI Express Gen 4. We got dual channel memory installed, not just one stick. We got two sticks. You got the Iris XE graphics, and uh, we'll see how fast it is. So the Intel Core i7 uh, 1280p, it's faster than I expected. With this naming scheme, I can never tell. Then I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's 14 cores and 20 threads. It turbos up to 4.8 gigahertz. This comes with Windows 11 Pro. I did need to upgrade this to 24H2. The secret is don't plug in the Ethernet adapter. Get through the, the initial process and then you can update once you're in Windows. All right, let's go through the ports. On the front, we have two USB Type A. They're both USB 3.2 Gen 2. Then we have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a power button. On the side, you got your Kensington lock. On the other side, we've got an SD card reader, which is handier than I thought because I was always thinking about this in terms of my photography. But now I think about it in terms of ROMs. You can have like your master ROM set with all of your emulators on an SD card and pop it inside. That's kind of a brilliant way to do it. All right, flip it around the back and we have a nice array of things. We got the DCN starting from the left there. Then we have a USB 4 and that also supports a display port. Dis display port? Yes. HDMI 2.0 below that. Then our 2.5 gigabit uh, Ethernet port. Above that, or I guess beside that, we have USB 3.2 Gen 2, below that USB 2.0. Then we have another USB 4 and another HDMI 2.0. The USB 4 both support display ports. So you can run up to four displays with this. So the USB 4 will do 8K at 30 hertz and both of the HDMI 2.0 will do 4K at 60 hertz. All right, let's go ahead and hop in and get to those benchmarks. I've been kind of rushing through everything else because the benchmarks are kind of where it all matters to me. Let's see how we did on Cinebench. So yeah, the single core on these is really good because it uses one of those performance cores. Got a score of 1697. Now just note these are all older CPUs. A lot of the newer stuff and a lot of the Ryzen are quite a bit faster than this, but you know, not sure why they didn't put any of those on the chart, but okay, thanks very much. 
uh, multi-core. You can see somewhere in the middle there. These are all just crazy thread rippers on top. You know what, it's easier just to take the scores. 9113 on the multi-core. For Geekbench, single core, 2497, and the multi-core, 9871. Scroll on down here and you can see all the individual test scores. If there's something that's important to you, well, just pause it and take a look. And then for the OpenCL, that's actually pretty good. 15223, and here's all the individual scores again. All right, Unigen Superposition. This taxes both the GPU and the CPU, running it at 1080p on the medium setting. And we've got a score of 30, 37, average 22.72, minimum 19.03. Unigen Valley. This is pretty good for an uh, you know integrated XE graphics from Intel. 50.9, score of 2130. Minimum 21.4. I'm just gonna play a few indie games on this to show you the kind of you know stuff that you can play on an integrated Intel GPU. Starting off with Beyond Sunset because that's my new thing. Really want to get into this a little bit more. Actually, we're gonna play this with GLES because they recommend it for Intel and notebook GPUs. So yes, let's jump in. It's got a lot going on. They've pulled from so many different things. I'm kind of glad they pulled the movement system almost directly out of uh, Doom Eternal. You can do the double jump and the dash in midair, which I like. It's it feels good. But then you have some stuff that's kind of immersive sim. Little deus sexy stuff going on here. Where you're like taking missions like this one. You'll need to find the man in the pink suit and remove his right hand. Very important. Oh yes, this runs so well. Beautifully well, I might add. So you can like really mess with this game now. So yeah, this is a... Uh, here we go, get your terminals. Look at this. This is very deus ex. Or a uh, system shock or something. I have not gotten uh, into this game just because I haven't had time to play it. But if you're looking for something that you can play on this, that is a, it's a wad, you know, like a Doom Engine wad. It's got all the modern effects that you would expect, like rain and everything. Well, modern-ish. And it's got a little bit of flavor of, um, I don't know, all kinds of different games. You got your Samurai Sword, you got your Cyberpunk setting, you got your Double Jump and Dash, like from Doom Eternal. You got your immersive sim stuff going on. You got your NPCs you can you know, chat with or whatever. This is something you can really jump into, so check it out. Another game I've been showing off to people who like Fatal Frame, Silent Hill, and games like that, uh, whatever else, whatever, uh, Resident Evil, yes, that's the one I couldn't remember. Well, you need to check out this game called Heartworm. So it's, I, I guess you're, I won't tell you too much, but I think your grandpa or something died, is that what it was? And you're going to investigate pieces of his death in this weird house or something like that. I'm not going to spoil too much I haven't so here we are in pixel mode I got my tank con controls going don't know why I don't even like tank controls that much but whatever now when you're in the house normally you're gonna have to press F because you've got a camera and that just flashes the flash without you know using the camera so you can use that as a way to see where you're going as you're getting around game runs really well on this machine let's go ahead and see how it runs without the pixel filter it's not just a filter because the game runs much better with the pixelization on so I think they're actually running at a lower resolution. Um, it runs okay, like this. Doesn't feel 100% quite as good. The animations look a little bit more stuttery. Not quite as smooth, but uh, let's see. No, this runs okay. So yeah, you can play this with the pixelization filter on and off. It was a really well optimized game, I guess. Um, you know, indie developers optimizing things better than AAA these days. This is a Unity game, so you do have the, the weight of the Unity engine in the background. All right, we're getting into some spoiler territory here. So if I go up these stairs, it's pretty. I won't tell you what's going on. All right, let's have a look at this stress test. It's been running for 27 minutes. The maximum, well, it says 92 up here. That seemed to like hit the 92 when I first turned on hardware info. So I don't know, I haven't seen a 92 here. It's just been in the 70s the whole time if you look at the chart. So, yeah, I don't know where that came from. Right now it's 74 degrees, and that's where it's been pretty much the whole time between 74 and 75. It's not that loud either. Let's uh, let's listen. That's my obnoxiously loud room right there. Let's see how loud the unit is. It's very quiet. I mean, you can hear it, but it's very, very low hum. So this is one of the quieter mini PCs out there. Okay, yeah, Geekom, you do not have to go crazy with your M.2, but you did. So 7079 on the read, 6146 on the right. What is this again? I, I already forgot to look. It looks like Wadposit, huh? That is one fast drive. Let's see how the IOPS are. Now these drives use cache, so it won't always be that. It'll sometimes drop down to somewhere between three and 5,000 megabytes per second, but yeah. 
The IOPS, what is going on? My God, look at these IOPS. 286,000 IOPS on the read, 222, I mean 225,000 on the right. Those are some ridiculous numbers right there for the IOPS. So yeah, that's really fast. When it comes to the, the temperatures, it never got above 56. That's basically ice cold. The entire system is doing a really good job of keeping itself nice and cool, but there is a thermal pad on top and that's probably what's you know keeping this nice and cool. So let's take a look at hardware info. You got six of the P cores, those are performance cores. Those are hyper-threaded, so you get 12 threads. And then we have eight E cores, uh, giving you eight threads because they're not hyper-threaded. Over here, we've got a total of 24 megabytes of L3 cache. And then we have 32 gigabytes of DDR4 because this is a an i7-1280. So DDR4 is still pretty snappy. Doesn't have quite the error correction of DDR5, but for a regular computer, it's totally fine. I'm still using DDR4 in my system. For our graphics, we have an Intel Iris Xe. We'll put that to the test in just a second. They say it's got 16 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, can you imagine? It's sharing some of the system memory right now. It's sharing up to up to half, I believe, is what the default is in the UEFI. Over here in the network, we got a couple different controllers. We've got an Intel Gigabit Ethernet controller. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the i. 226V, that's 2.5 gigabit per second. And then over here, this MediaTek, we've got the MT7922 Wi-Fi 6E. There you go, very, very capable PC. Um, if you're looking for gaming, you might wanna to look towards some of the AMD offerings that they have. Uh, those are generally gonna be better when it comes to just gaming. And when you're talking about like the, the same, you know, brackets there. But um, for pure CPU power and lots of cores, and if you want to run Proxmox and have all kinds of stuff going at the same time, you're going to get a lot of cores, a lot of threads out of this. So that's nice. The CPU performance is good. And, um, you know, overall, it's just a super solid little system that has all the ports that you can need, probably. And uh, the build quality is tank-like, I guess. So it's just a Geekom, so their build quality is tank-like. I wish that the Intel... Uh, CPUs did have better graphics. Some of them do the ultras, but those are so, so like, you know, up there. They get way up there. But um, with something like this, it's hard to argue. Just if you're someone who needs Intel, you never get fired for buying an Intel. Is that how it works? I don't know in this day and age. Anyway, let me know what you think and I'll see you next time.